one fresh and tender kiss Welcome to Ward 13 with John Hopwood, and my guest today is Lincoln Soldati, a candidate for Congress in CD1. Yes, thank you for having me. Now, I was stationed in the Army in Germany. Soldaten means soldiers. What is soldati? Uh, uh, in Italian, it means, it means soldiers. Soldiers. Yes. I was thinking it was Italian. Yes, it is. I. But uh, after World War II and World War I, my uh, grandfather's World War I, my father, my father, World War II, all sorts of things get shifted around. There's all sorts of different ethnic groups that were moved around. Sure, yeah. When you think of Germans, when I was in Germany, oh no, I'm a Bavarian, I'm from Augsburg, I'm a <laughs> you know. Right, sure. It's like, it was like being in the United States where like, I'm from Texas, the Bavarians were right. particularly, right. pains in the behind, as uh, Andrew, Andrea Merkel's finding out. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yes. Why don't you tell uh, the audience, uh, introduce yourself. Sure. Uh, my name is Lincoln Soldati, and uh, I'm a native New Hampshire, uh, uh, New Hampshireite. I grew up in Portsmouth and Exeter. Uh, moved to Exeter when I was 10 years old, and um, uh, went to St. Thomas Aquinas High School. Uh, went to University of Notre Dame for my undergraduate now, degree. I, I've got to stop you for yeah. a minute, because I'm laughing because... We've got the background, and when I'm looking, at, you've got ears. Oh, okay. Can we try oh. the other background if we get a chance, <laughs> which is just a map? Or well, we I can do, go I for do a have ears, but uh, not those ears. <laughs> I'm yeah. watching you when you're okay. talking, and you've got these ears oh, from I the see. panda yeah. bear. Yeah. But uh, so or well, we could why, go with a Why is that your uh, graphic? Do you have a fondness for pandas, or what? Uh, how did that? Yeah. Well, <laughs> a light background in the old days did not. We had made a shift and it didn't come over well. So I went with this one. Then I tried, I changed my show to Queen City Chronicles with the hope that people would come on to my show, but they never did. Because I'm the, I'm the notorious John Hopwood. 
I was sued by uh, our illustrious former mayor, Ted Gatsis. Oh, yes. yes yeah, yes, yeah. Yes, I, I don't yeah. know if you read, read the dismissal. But if I start talking about him, I'll wind back up the Elliott Hospital yeah, where yeah. they thought I had a stroke. <laughs> yeah, you find out uh, it's like being Gary Cooper in uh, <laughs> ha, uh, High Noon. High Noon, you know? yes. Where is everybody? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, well, look. Uh, we're in a two shot now. Okay. You don't have any ears. Oh, good. But we good. do have okay. the panda. Yeah. You yeah. were saying you went to St. Thomas. So you were born in New Hampshire. I was, yeah. 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 And um, um, And where are we again? In, uh, well, so I, so I grew up in developed. Portsmouth and Exeter. Okay. So in an area of okay. Portsmouth called Wentworth Acres, which at the time was uh, sort of a government housing project for post World oh, really? War II returning vets. And that was my dad. So oh. that sort of, uh, that was you know where I yeah. first grew up and then when I was 10 years old they uh, were able to uh, finally uh, buy a house in Exeter and we moved to Exeter but uh, yeah. And what was your father? Well my father was uh, most of his life he was a chef. Uh, he had a restaurant in Durham in the late 40s early 50s uh, and uh, went on to have a number of different things. He was a caterer for uh, most of his uh, adult life, uh, which he operated the catering business really out of the basement of our home in Exeter. Uh, my mother uh, also worked. She was in uh, civil engineering at Pease Air Force Base. She actually started a work uh, a week before the base actually opened, and she was there uh, until it closed. So when did Pease open? Oh gosh, it had to be uh, sometime in the early 50s. It was like Grenier was. Uh, and she, she was at the Navy Yard actually yeah. before that, so which we uh, which we lost to uh, Maine, which we lost to Maine. <laughs> well, yeah. Now your father was Italian. Uh, was he yes. first generation or he was first generation? My grandfather and grandmother came over, settled in Summersworth, New Hampshire. Uh, uh, you know, after not long after the turn of the century, uh, my grandfather was a stonemason. And uh, my grandmother, as I um, often say, was below. Stonemason. No, Stonemason, yeah, hard worker. Stonemasons <laughs> were actually worker. imported laborers. Yeah. They yeah. were experts at the, and the Italians were not, that yeah, was a yeah. craftsman. Yeah. He, he actually uh, laid the riprap of the uh, Exeter River along the Swayze Parkway uh, back in the 30s. Uh, and without, without an ounce of cement, and it's still there today. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they were in Concord, they just found out that they had used to build a canal for one of the mills. Italian laborers from Massachusetts, yeah. but a different situation. Yeah, you know? yeah. Just like uh, <laughs> people being used now from other countries. Yeah, yeah. yeah for, no, uh, yeah. You know. But he was, he was a hard worker, you know. And my grandmother, who never learned English, was beloved in her community. And they raised seven kids uh, in Summersworth. There were uh, four boys and three girls, and all the boys were... Uh, you know, kind of rugged football players and uh, sort of put Summersworth on the map, uh, so to speak, for football. And uh, uh, anyway, it was, a, it was uh, you know, they, they had a wonderful family that they praised and uh, they, they were loved in their community, notwithstanding uh, that today they probably would not be allowed to enter this country under the current regulations. Well, I, I, my grandmother never learned I English. That, my uh, grandfather had I don't no, know, I, was, I don't know was not high skilled. So I was thinking about something. Both my uh, my father's grandfather, Hopwood, what married into a Whittemore family of New Hampshire, which makes me related to Princess Diana yeah, and right, stuff okay, like that. Great. And <laughs> you can go and find you know all the history of sure, New Hampshire. Sure. But then I realized and. Uh, his grandfather from his father's side was from England, and his grandfather from his mother's side was from Scotland, who came here. They used to, well, England would not allow skilled mill workers to come to the United States. You can go to Canada. So you went to Canada and you just walked over the border. <laughs> there was no illegal immigrants till 1922, because you just, you just came. Uh, but remember, one of the things in 19, when you mentioned that from 1922, they had the uh, quotas, particularly against Southern uh, Europeans, oh, yes. immigrants, yes. Uh, Greeks, right. Armenians. Well, and each yeah. wave of immigrants, right. you know, suffered from uh, a variety of discriminations. I mean, the yeah. Irish, you know, the Irish for, for a long time, you know, they were referred to as the shanty Irish, and, uh, you know, they were, they were discouraged. The Italians were called WAPs, and, of course, that, oh, of course. that was W-O-P. That meant without papers. Right. Um, you know, so... 
uh, you know, that's sort of the sad side of the immigrant story of America, you know, because yeah. of, you know, there's always some sort of discrimination against new people coming in, but it's the history of our country. You know, um, we're built on immigrants. Godfather too, uh, Vito is when he's a boy, <laughs> well, yeah. but he's sick, so they have to put them in the cell, yeah. and then he's singing the song to himself, <laughs> yeah. which is the first time he's been able to even <laughs> verbalize in a long time. But I was thinking, wh when you were saying that, it wasn't I was going to rebut you, I was just thinking, you know, get trying to get the brain work because yeah, yeah. yeah in 22 so is it working yet i mean are we okay <laughs> you don't you don't want it working <laughs> but uh oh yeah but i was just thinking because you know yeah uh you just walked over well see jim o'connell was wrong about rennie gagnon he's what we'd call a frog uh, french canadian he was born in manchester and uh, my mother would not admit she was part french canadian until she was in her 70s we we're in a canadian theme restaurant with a moose, talking moose, and I can't tell you what she said. She was starting to get Alzheimer's, and that should have been a, a, a clue, but, uh, and my father did not know Grace Metallius was French-Canadian until I told him in the year 2000, because they had grown up with teenagers with Grace, oh, yeah, sure. and yeah, uh, yeah. people just didn't, yeah. they Peyton, were like the Peyton last Place, thing. right? I mean, yeah. is that right? So right. Gilmington. Right. <laughs> Gilmington Ironworks, yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. But she was from Manchester, and being the French Canadians, being so discriminated against, yeah. we just didn't mention it, yeah. although she did write a novel later. Though we didn't mind them working yeah. in our factories, did we? Well, you or if you were an Irishman yeah. and uh, on strike, and you comp everybody complains and complains and complains. And uh, I was just rereading. Yes, but we didn't take their children away from them, did we? I, I don't know. No, we didn't. I wasn't, th I yeah, wasn't we back did, We didn't do that. We didn't do that. Oh, well, if you want to talk about immigration, go ahead. Because you are, uh, you are running for Congress. I am What does Congress. the House of Representatives, what can the House of Representatives do? Because, you know, the Senate is, and then there's the House. Well, there is the House, and there's a lot that, I mean, the, the irony to me about right. the position we're in today is if you go back just a few years ago, we actually did pass, the Senate passed, which is the tougher body in many ways uh, because of the cloture rules and the filibuster. Yeah. Uh, the Senate actually passed comprehensive immigration reform. Sims, well, are you talking about the, Well, the Gang of Eight, yeah. the yeah. Gang of Eight bill, okay? And um, right. it wasn't a perfect piece of legislation, but it was a piece of legislation, and it was a far better cry from the way things uh, uh, were at the time, and much better than they are today. And then the bill went from the, from the Senate to the House. Now, an interesting thing about the House of Representatives, under the Constitution, in order to pass something in the House, unlike the Senate, you only need a majority right. of the House of Representatives. Right. And here's, here's really the kicker. At that time, there was a majority of the members of the House of Representatives that would have voted in favor of that Senate bill. We could have had today comprehensive immigration reform. Right. But they didn't allow it to be debated. They didn't allow it to be voted on because something uh, called uh, what they call the Hastert Rule. It's not a real rule. Den it, dear old Dennis Hastert. Yes, it was a rule made up by Dennis Hastert, okay, yeah. who was a uh, Republican. Now disgraced Dennis Hastert. Uh, Republican Speaker of the House who was convicted of bank fraud, and, uh, uh, and the bank fraud was related to his abusing children when he was a wrestling coach right. uh, when he was younger. So here you have this pedophile uh, who is a convicted felon that the Republicans decide to name a rule after him that they're going to follow. They call it the Hastert rule. Okay, It still exists? So <laughs> it still exists. And Paul Ryan used to refer to it, still does refer to it. But it was Boehner who originally followed it and said because of the Hastert rule, the, na the, the rule named after the pedophile, the Republican pedophile, you remember that. Okay. Oh, I so know about that, Dennis so, Hastert. So, so, yeah. I was so, writing, because uh, of that rule, right and that rule said, oh, we can't debate anything, discuss anything, or vote on anything unless, as a precondition, we have a majority of the, quote, majority that favors it. <coughs> and it doesn't matter whether you have a majority of the House, just whether you have a majority of the majority. <coughs> and because they didn't, 
they never that bill never saw the light of day in the House of Representatives. It's like uh, and Uncle Ryan Joe did Can the same thing on Boehner. It's like Uncle Joe Cannon back a hundred and twenty years ago, where the, you know the Speaker was a boss. Yeah, yeah. But and that, then there was the reforms of the today. and that was then that's there was why we had the problems today. Then there was the reforms of the seventies because and that was a democratic uh, leadership that was so mm -hmm. out of touch. Well, yeah. there's been many many points right. since uh, since the twenties where there's been right. things that have really made a mess of immigration, um, and it, but it really actually wasn't until the I want to say it was in the eighties um, where we actually passed legislation that finally sort of made it illegal. I mean, we didn't even have have anyone that was referred to, excuse me, as uh, as an illegal immigrant until really the 80s when they passed uh, statutes. Right. And I, frankly, I think it was Clinton that got those passed. Um, and I think it was the Clinton bill. Um, well, so the Simpson bill in, uh, was passed in the 80s. When I came back from the Army in 89, I went to California. You had to show a passport to get a, uh, an, you know, uh, apartment because there was like this fever going around, you know, which I was never asked again after like 1989. And... Uh, that was a strange. Oh, we need a photocopy and, and yeah, that. Yeah. And it's like and that was San Francisco, for God's sakes. Wow. But uh, well, we've never uh, had somebody since maybe uh, ex-president. Uh, who was the jackass uh, from Taylor <laughs> from New York? Uh, Millard Fillmore. Oh, Jesus. When he was the know nothing, oh, gosh, uh, yeah, yeah, the which know -nothing didn't last right. very long. Not last very long, right? That's you true. seldom see. Fortunately, you know, so and, and hopefully this one won't last long. Either. Right, uh, yeah, uh, the president has a uh, has a certain way of handling things uh, in an indelicate manner. I would say <laughs> indelicate. Uh, he's indelicate. Whenever, <laughs> whenever, whenever he's not lying, he's indelicate. So that's the way it goes, right? That's well, uh, I remember somebody that uh, telling me during the last campaign, and who knew Hillary Clinton, saying she couldn't go uh, two days without lying. But then he was just flabbergasted. Because people didn't know about Donald Trump. He was just, you know, right. I was in New York. Couldn't go Trump. 30 seconds, so, you know. <laughs> he couldn't go two minutes That's without right. lying. That's right. Yeah, Donald, it's the same Donald back in uh, 1984 when he was with the, U, you know, acting up. Well, he's a grifter, you know. I mean, he's been a con artist for, oh, for his the, whole life. The That's New York what he real does. estate That's industry of that yeah. era. Yeah. But uh, back then he was a liberal Democrat. As he was uh, up till 2011. Well, yeah, you know, <laughs> that may have been what he called himself, right. but you know, I mean, th this is someone with no beliefs, so you know, it's whatever the con works at the moment is what he does. You know, it, uh, it, it's an insult to Burt Lancaster, who was a great actor and a great <laughs> liberal, but he would have been ideal playing him because he played Elmer Gantry. Yes, I, 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 yes, Elmer Gantry is a great. I, great I wrote role. about movies for years, never got into any trouble. Not the same <laughs> with politics. Yeah, uh, income inequality, what would you, the one thing that, that strikes me about the Democratic Party of now, and I've been a Democrat since 1977, when I was 18 years old, is that the, if you know uh, the history of Rome, and, uh, and I'm not being uh, I'm politically well, correct because you're okay. Italian, you know, you had the, the party of the Optimates, and then there was the party of the Plebeians. Of course, they were all aristocrats just playing different uh, uh, factions against each other and you know maybe the plebeian leader would give them a few crumbs so people didn't revolt or anything but the democrats seem to have uh including people that were there with mcgovern gone right over to the optimates you know to the the, the you know you could always say about the republicans they were dedicated to to this thing that government of the rich, for the rich, and by, by the, the rich, rich right. won't perish from, yeah, the, from yeah. the face of the earth. Yes. Now that it seems that the Democrats are on that bandwagon too. Well, uh, there's something. Uh, there's you certainly, know, I'm uh, hyperbole. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I get that, but uh, yeah, there's uh, there's certainly uh, a measure of truth to that. I mean, r really, the system right now is so corrupt, and what's corrupting it is money. And, uh, and, of course, right. Citizens United had a lot to do with that, uh, but it didn't create it. It, it. it merely sort of defined it in some ways uh, that we hadn't really sort of noticed before. Uh, and now they made it legal. They made it legal to be corrupt. They made it legal right. for corporate, you know, this idea that corporations are people 
and that money is speech. You know, that, 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 that's, that's the fallacy of Citizens United, that corporations are people. They're not. And I, I take exception about whether or not the, uh, you know, the Bill of Rights was intended for, uh, uh, to be uh, a launching pad for corporations. I think it was to protect the rights of the individual. Well, what's uh, so funny, uh, all of a sudden, uh, when I was a kid, 1776 was the big uh, musical and everything but of course now uh, Jefferson and Jackson uh, Jefferson and uh, Hamilton is is out of the pantheon even though he in a way is the soul of America better or worse but a lot ways better and uh, but now it's Hamilton you know the the plutocrats plutocrat and I brought up Jackson because uh, Jackson really went to war with uh, that idea of the American system. It's, so, it's fascinating, you know, American history, how it continually cycles through. But uh, I, I'm thinking when we're talking, because we, we can bring up the Supreme Court, even though the, uh, you know, the House has no say in it. But right. uh, Jackson right. uh, put Taney on the Supreme Court, and he was a loyal a justice, a Jacksonian. What, 25 years later, you know, with Dred Scott, he gets like one of the worst decisions yeah, ever. Exactly. But, uh, you know, and I'm thinking of Schlesinger's book, you know, which is a liberal book of its time yeah. after World War II. But the court on Tolteni, property's property. A, 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 you can't really charter a court. You know, once you've chartered something, you can't regulate it. Once you've given it that charter, that's like the Federalist and Whig system, Daniel Webster, you know? Yeah. You can't regulate anything. But Taney goes in there and says, oh, the hell you can't. <laughs> you know? And that really started stirring things up. But the idea with the slaughterhouse cases that the 14th Amendment, the perversion of that, yeah. Yeah. meant to help the freedmen, right. Right. that a business is a person right and but not till the 70s right. and it's an ideological thing in the court you're yeah. starting to build yeah. up yeah that it, it's crazy right. but you just said that yeah. this is speech yeah. I mean think about Nixon ITT Rita Beard I mean you know I we used to come back from high school I'm 58 and watch the Watergate hearings but ITT gave Nixon 200,000 in cash yeah. which is like 2 million yeah. So it was done then. And well, it's not yeah, like I mean, all, all of Watergate. I mean, it was all about right. the slush fund. It was all about follow money. the money, wasn't it? Yeah, it was all about money. But it uh, wasn't and it still legal. is. But now, well, no, now it is. Now you've got the Koch brothers. You've got, you know, the Black fossil money. fuel industry. Uh, you've got the insurance industry. I mean, you want to talk about health care. Yeah. It actually came out of... Uh, uh, the Nixon administration, there's a tape of this. I don't know if you ever listened to this tape. There's a conversation between Ehrlichman and uh, Nixon. And Ehrlichman is explaining uh, this new concept from Kaiser Permanente. Do you ever listen to this tape? No. You hear this tape? Oh, you gotta look this up, you'll love this. Anyway, so Edgar Kaiser is explaining to Ehrlichman, who's then explaining it to yeah. Nixon on the tape. And uh, so Kaiser, uh, uh, Edward Kaiser says to Ehrlichman, he says, all the incentives go in the right direction. He says, what do you mean? Now he's talking about HMOs. This was the birth right. of the HMO. And he says, all of the incentives go in the right direction. So what do you mean by that? And he says, the less care we provide, the more money we make. To which Nixon says, okay. <laughs> and uh, thought it was a great idea. Not bad, he says, not bad. And that is the very foundation of our health care system ever since. Because we don't have yeah, a health care system. We're supposed to be we have a health insurance system. Yeah. And more, I even worse than that, it's a for-profit insurance system. The whole point yeah. of the system is to make money for insurance companies. And it is doomed to failure. Uh, because it means uh, we have the most expensive health care system in the world with one of yeah. among the worst outcomes. Oh, I agree. Uh, we have an incoming call. Hi, and welcome to Ward 13. Are you taking calls tonight? Yeah, sure. Don't Are you ready for my question? Right, but don't turn your TV off if you're watching it. What is it, some type of stem winder? Okay. Nothing about Ted Gatz's, yeah, no, please. <laughs> okay, go ahead. I, I had a question uh, for Mr. Soldati. Um, there's 11 candidates running currently for, for this position in the primary. 
Um, and one candidate, Maura Sullivan, is bringing in lots of out-of-state money um, early on. Yep. And Chris Pappas is gathering endorsements um, from a lot of the old-school uh, New Hampshire Democrats. So I just sort of like his take on what makes him different and uh, what is his take on how this uh, primary is playing out. Hey, thank you very much for that question. Okay, uh, well, uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm different from each of them and for, for different reasons and some of the same reasons. Uh, I think what makes me different from uh, really all of the other candidates uh, is the breadth of my experience. I've uh, been elected to more, I've won more elections than all other candidates combined. You were the county attorney. In Stratford County for nine terms, that's 18 years. And that's you, correct. Yeah, you're it's an elected body, of course. That's correct. Yeah. Uh, I was also uh, eight years on the Summersworth School Board, and I was the mayor of Summersworth. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So, so that's right. I have uh, uh, an understanding, a familiarity with local issues and how uh, people's lives are affected. I've uh, been responsible to uh, my constituents uh, for many, many years, about 25 years of my life. I've been in some form of uh, public service. Uh, I don't need to conduct a, um, a poll to know what issues are important to me uh, or my constituents because I've been listening to uh, the people of this district for 25 years as an elected official and decades more as a neighbor and uh, a, a professional serving my community. Um, so uh, my experience alone is one of the things that distinguishes me from either of those candidates. Uh, I am uh, very independent. Uh, when I was a county attorney, I was, one, I was the only county attorney that actually testified in favor of repeal of the death penalty. And some people thought as, you know, as a prosecutor that would hurt my reelection. Uh, it did not. I was reelected uh, by uh, uh, the uh, voters in Stratford County. Uh, so I've been known to take uh, difficult positions. Uh, I've also uh, been an activist. I went to Palestine, uh, to the West Bank, to uh, mentor Palestinian public defenders. I, have, I uh, drove out to uh, North Dakota, uh, to Standing Rock, to, uh, oh, okay. to uh, uh, help the Sioux uh, fight for their water rights. Uh, unfortunately, that, sent, that ended somewhat tragically, but nonetheless. Jeez, talk about, you know, uh, talk uh, about people. That, so, uh, but my yeah. point is, is yeah. you know, I, I've right. been engaged my yeah. whole life. And, and, and being from New Hampshire, being a native from New Hampshire, um, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, gives me an insight. And particularly being uh, such a long-term uh, public elected official, uh, gives me insights into uh, serving uh, my community. Service has been something I've been about uh, my entire life. Uh, I think the other part of it is uh, the money aspect of this. I um, am not taking corporate PAC money. I'm not taking, taking special interest money. We're running a grassroots uh, campaign. Um, and, uh, and that's one of the things that distinguishes me as well. I know there's a lot of money in this race for some candidates. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and most of that money comes from out of state. You know, most of my money are, uh, that uh, that we've been able to raise has been from uh, small donors within New Hampshire, people I grew up with, people who've known me, uh, et cetera. Um, the other aspect of it that uh, distinguishes me is uh, I've actually been uh, standing up for issues in this state for a long time. Uh, you know, I was known as a tough prosecutor. I was known as a tough defense attorney. Uh, I understand, having been both a prosecutor and defense attorney, I understand what it is uh, to represent both sides. And I understand the difference between uh, when you have to compromise, when you have to negotiate, and when, on principle, you have to take a stand and, in my case, go to trial, so to speak. Uh, I understand those differences because I've lived those my whole life. I've raised a family here. I've, I've raised four children. I've been married for 43 years. Um, uh, and, uh, as I said, you know, served my community. Uh, so I think that I bring unique skills as a trial lawyer for almost 40 years. I have skills as an advocate that, um, uh, frankly, I don't see many of those uh, running that can match. Um, and I think that puts me in good stead. Uh, the other thing that I would like to do is I'd like to get appointed to the Judiciary Committee. I think I have the skills, uh, you know, I've conducted thousands of investigations. I've conducted many grand juries. I know how to cross-examine individuals. And uh, it is, after all, the House of Representatives that has, under the Constitution, the sole power of impeachment. Um, so I think that's a, an effort that I would be well suited for. Yeah, but uh, we, uh, I might have another stroke. 
a, a real one this time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we can only hope, right? Although, uh, one thing I'm thinking while you're talking is, uh, you know, we have uh, one candidate is from out of state and has a tremendous amount of money backing uh, her, and I don't understand why people, these organizations think, they don't even think about, this does, This isn't what's done in New Hampshire. It's done in California. Well, maybe Scott Brown changed things and he got his comeuppance, but that's like Well, Scott, Scott Brown did not win. And right. I don't think, it, you know, I, I think the issue and there is. I don't know is, if he outraised Gene Shaheen. Uh, well, he may have. I don't know. He was a Republican, so he might have. So uh, there was a lot of money. In <laughs> there was a lot it of money. Set the record. But but the yeah. uh, you know I think there is a principle involved here in relation to that, and that but principle like is: list. do we really want to? Well, you know, there's other women what running. That that was. Uh, you, I was a little you surprised a, at Emily's list on that. And one. you, but you have a background in prosecuting yes. uh, uh, sexual assault That's cases correct. and child abuse and yes. that, and it's just like. When I saw that, it's like this. It was like a disconnect to me. How was that a disconnect? When well, who is Maura Sullivan? Has oh, she oh, ever oh, been you're in asking office? Me about well, I, you know, I don't really want to talk about Maura. Right. No, she, <laughs> as far as I know, she's never been in office. You know, she um, just, you know, this she is, was in the military. That's, this that is, we know, right? You know, we've, I, you know, we've all been. Yeah, yeah we've all been in the Marine. military, right? But, yeah. uh, I was in the army, so. So was I. <laughs> but I'm just thinking, it was a disconnect. It's like. Here, just, well, there are people right. who want to decide uh, who is going to represent us that are not people from New Hampshire. Uh, we've seen that before. We see it with the Free Stater movement and so forth. Yeah, but they and, move here. <laughs> well, well, but the idea, I mean, this is similar because the idea is um, yeah. you can buy an election in New Hampshire. And I think what we have to do is, is to prove that wrong. Uh, we do not want the message to be that you can come into New Hampshire and buy an election, uh, because uh, I think that is a terrible precedent for us to set. Um, right, you know, but I just and don't those of us that you know love the state, grew up in the state, understand the state, it's in our blood. Uh, you know, we do not want to give this state up to people outs of outside interests. We right, don't. Once again, we're talking about money. Right. And where's the responsibility about it? Speaking of money. Have you been able to get uh, data on voters, or is the New Hampshire Democratic Party still demanding? Was it thirty? Uh, I've heard thirty-seven thousand five hundred dollars, which I think only two candidates would be able to just come up with that. Well, there might have been three, but uh, w w we elected to uh, get our data through other sources. Uh, whereas the Republican candidates are getting this for free. That's correct. I, yeah. you know, yeah. we could have a whole different we, show we, about we the could, leadership could, of the New Hampshire <laughs> Democratic Party, but I've decided to be good to, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> well, uh, the most surreal, one of the most surreal moment of my life has got to be uh, uh, going to St. Anselm's where, you know, we go every two years, yeah. and, you know, Al Baldessera, who wasn't there this year, <laughs> uh, this th last time, would be there. We'd yell at each other. Afterwards, we'd see, we could see each other at the studio. Al's Al, and he's, you know, he's another veteran. Yeah. The only Marine I ever knew that did 24 years and never got anywhere near combat. So, <laughs> you know, I'm just teasing him now. I don't know if that's true or not. But, you know, that's, but Al, you know, we yell at each other. He wasn't there. But there was a third candidate, and their people are claiming, oh, well, she, uh, Carol Shea Porter is a uh, puppet of the DNC. Now, on this show, I'm the first one before WikiLeaks that broke what Ray Buckley did to Carol Shea Porter. And I, had, I was leaned on very heavily, not by him, but by, by other people. It would behoove me not to talk about that and take it off. Now, I don't want to, I'm not going to, uh, by talking about that, it'd be so like I'm criticizing one of the candidates right. who I can separate from that. Right. But uh, that was surreal, and to be there, and it's like, and it's like no, I decided not to run for state rep for many reasons. But my God, you know, come come, we'll have a whole show about that uh, whenever. But, well, uh, I, you know, my, you my take to, on that is, right. I, you know, I may not be the uh, uh, the candidate That's of the party elite. Uh, but I hope to be the candidate right. of the people of this district. That's not what the Democrats that I joined were supposed to do. 
They're not right. supposed to treat the party as their personal property. That's right. And make and I understand right. gets fifteen percent of every buck that goes through NHDP. I don't know if that's true or not, and I don't know if I could ever find out that information. Yeah, I, you know, I, I know nothing about that, lawsuit. so I'm not I'm not uh, I'm not <laughs> casting any aspersions. I just I don't want I, you know. I want to be the candidate of the people of this district, and and that's it. I'm well, I have no it. allegiance. I, I have no uh, you know I, I don't belong to the party. I'm not their candidate. Uh, you know, right. I, I belong to the people of this district and always have. Well, something like immigration should be uh, about principle, not right. that, well, this is an issue that I'm going to use to raise money right. to attack Trump or whatever, right. which with certain leadership, you could, th you could actually call into question their principles, or maybe I'm being unfair. But <laughs> my idea of a Democratic Party was something that came out of the post-Watergate period, you know? And also, Bobby Kennedy was my hero as a kid. Yeah, well, the Democrats in the post Watergate uh, was not a bad party. <laughs> no, you know? it wasn't. But you know? uh, um, let's. You know, uh, the yeah. principles seemed to have uh, more meaning at that time, and uh, money a lot less influence, at least within our party. Then uh, they seemed to take uh, Lenny Bruce's uh, mantra, which was a satire. Uh, gr what is it? Uh, grow up and sell out, or. <laughs> Of course, Jeez. Lenny never did. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. Okay. But, uh, yeah, but the party sp is supposed to be something more, you know. Than yeah. It's supposed to be about the people and for the people. And we see in Brooklyn, in district in Brooklyn, yeah. we just saw a major upset yeah. of, of Crowley, yeah. who some people saw as a potentially replacing Nancy Pelosi. Well, well, I, I, I think that's Which unlikely. But, unlikely since it's a But, but I also dog, think yeah. people read a little too much into that. The, the, yeah, the, real, right. the real basis there was is that Crowley lost that election. He didn't she, campaign. He didn't you campaign. Know, he and took she it for hustled. granted. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, any time you start taking the voters for granted, uh, you're going to have a tough time. And, uh, and that's exactly what he did. And, uh, you know, I don't want to diminish what she did because she was bright enough to realize that uh, oh, he was not, uh, yeah. he was not, you know, and she literally, you know, knocked on every door she could knock on and, and she worked every day, you know, and he was down in Washington commiserating with the, you know, the leadership <laughs> and not paying attention to his district. You have to pay attention to the people you represent. That's the bottom line. That's how, you know, that's how you get reelected. It's not about the money. Yeah. As much as Washington yeah. and the party thinks it's about money, it's about serving your constituency. Well, uh, Carol, she won Which is going what, door to door. That's right. That's right. And she was not, you know, uh, uh, she was not the party favorite. She was not Never. the <laughs> DCCC. That's right. Yeah. Uh, but what she taught us is that you could appeal uh, directly to the people, and if you did your job for the people, uh, they would support you. Now, you know, it was a tough district. She had her had her struggles uh, uh, at different times, uh, but the things that she stood she stood for principle, and that's what you've got to do. That's true. Nobody Absolutely. could. Uh, you know? I used to be, uh, we have a local character, an alderman, Joe Kelly Lavasser, and I'd be on his show, and, you know, he'd be defending Frank Ginter, and I'd be defending Carol, and like he said, he might not like her politics, but he knew exactly what they were, exactly. and she had principles, That's right. and she stuck to them. That's right. Yeah. That's it right. wasn't politics as uh, a limbo, which was popular when I was a boy. Yeah, Everybody exactly. seemed to have limbo out. Yeah. How low yeah. can you yeah. go is one of go. them. Exactly. But, uh, yeah. yeah, there's, well, yeah. Well, it was, you know, you mentioned Hamilton earlier. You know, Hamilton's the one who said, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. You know, well, which I think is part of the reason we are where we are today, to be honest with you. I'm not a ham. I'm, I, I, I was not raised uh, to <laughs> well, think of anything positive I, I'm not about Hamilton. His political philosophy but it was a great <laughs> quote from him. You know, you got to give the man credit for a good quote. So. A bad shot. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I grew up. Uh, what was it? The when I was a kid, you'd, you'd watch a, a talk show would have Norman Mailer and Gore Vidal, oh, yeah. two lefties who hated each, who've been friends but hated each other. Are ready? Are they going to punch this? Norman yeah, or you'd have, or you'd have, uh, uh, what was his name with the <laughs> National Review? Um, oh, William, Buck William Buckley. William Buckley and Gore Vidal. That was always oh, in interesting. Oh, in '68. That was yeah. always well, interesting. Well, they all, they, they almost did have yeah, a fight. Yeah, 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 but exactly. you'd have people come on and talk about stuff. Yeah. Um, it was a different world back then, and. Uh, but things change. Things but I'm just change. saying, some things change, but yeah. some things don't. Well, uh, you know, like you're asking me what distinguished me, and I, uh, let me give you one other thing that does, and that is my position on health care. 
uh, which is an issue that I feel very strongly about, and I feel yeah. very strongly about single payer health care. I uh, agree. You know, uh, if there's a group called uh, Physicians for National Health Care Program, PNHP. Uh, and this group's been around for like 30 years. And, and they have the most brilliant proposal, and they go into it in depth. And these are physicians. These are people who know the healthcare system. They, they, they know all of this. And the fact of the matter is, you know, we spend more than any other nation on earth. Yeah. What, 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 what is it? It's 18% uh, of our GDP is on health care. That's $3.3 trillion, industry, yeah. you know. And yet we are like 37th in terms of uh, positive outcomes in our health care system. You know, so uh, that's not a good match. We spend 44% of that health care dollar on administration of the system. Yet with, uh, with Medicare, this system here, they spend between 2.5 and 4% on administration. So you're talking about generally a savings overall. If you went to a single payer system of $800 billion, you'd save. And the beauty, the best beneficiary of it all are employers. Why? Businesses. Because you eliminate, that's right. Because you eliminate their need or their requirement oh, yeah. to provide health care for their employees. Now, their percentage of um, Medicare costs would increase. That's true. But compared to what they pay for health care, you know, I, I was in the North Country a little while ago, and I'm talking, to, uh, I do this tour of this uh, factory this guy's had for 20 years. Great little business. When we're done, we sit down. And I ask him, I said, well, what percentage, you know, you provide health care, don't you? Yeah, I provide health care. What percentage of your uh, payroll goes towards health care for your employees? He says 25%. That's actually not that bad because most employers it's between twenty five and fifty. Oh yeah, I've okay? talked to restaurateurs. Yeah, yeah. And, so I so I small asked business him, Yeah, so I asked him, I said, Okay, let's assume that your health care costs would be six percent instead of twenty five. What would you do with that extra money? And he said, Well, in my case, I'd put it in the pockets of my employees. You know, because they deserve it, and they've been loyal to me and they've been good. I said, Well that's great. But the but the point of it is is that he would have money to do with whatever he wanted as a businessman. He could give it to his employees, give them raises. He could expand his business, hire more people. The point is, his business would benefit from a single-payer system. You all know, because businesses. All right. business. Every business in this country that provides health care to this employee would benefit. In fact, 95% of everyone would benefit. Only 5% would be end up paying more than they currently pay. And with a single-payer system, just so people understand what you're talking about. You're talking about no copay, no deductible, no lifetime limits. It would cover mental health, it would cover dental, it would cover ear, eyes, every medical condition, and it would be from prenatal to hospice care. Every, once you're, when you're born, you get your Medicare card and you're covered. You never get a bill from a doctor or a hospital. Yeah. And it's all because you eliminate for-profit insurance and eventually for-profit hospitals. Which have taken over all medical practice, and, all hospitals. And like Kaiser have. Permanente said, it's all about making more money by denying you more care. That's the system we have now. It's unsustainable. Unsustainable. And the candidates who talk about, oh, well, let's shore up Obamacare, you know, the ACA, Obamacare's. whatever. It's all, that's still built on for-profit insurance right. companies. I always call it the, uh, the no uh, health insurance company left behind that, <laughs> which is, you know, he saw what Hillary didn't do when they no. double-crossed her, so no. let's sell it out to the health Single insurance. Single-payer is the only, and, and the thing is, people say, oh, well, that's, uh, you know, government run. No, it isn't, because the only decisions made about your medical condition is between you and your doctor. The government doesn't get to say. The only role the government has, really, is to take the money and distribute it, you know, accordingly. They're not involved in any medical decisions. Unlike yeah. now, I mean, what happens now? Why well, now you go in, your doctor says, oh, you need an MRI. Well, somebody has to call up your insurance company, see if they're going to pay for it. And you know what? A lot of times they're not. They're going to say, oh, you got to do this, that, or the other thing. And so you get delayed treatment. <coughs> Sometimes for months, okay? Oh, yeah. That doesn't happen under Medicare. If I need an MRI, my doctor says I need an MRI, 18 seconds later, I'm in there having my MRI done. Uh, you know, it is a, is a, this is not government-run. You know, government-run health care is the VA, okay? This is single-payer, and we all are paying into it now. We all pay for it, you know? We do. Every paycheck, we pay for it. 
Well, the VA was fine until they started brutalizing it, cutting it, then we, that could be a whole entire show because they are one of my health care providers. Yeah, yeah. And getting, there's so much to talk about. First of all, the United States, I think under George W. Bush, was going to take Canada to uh, the GATT, uh, the world, uh, whatever the tribunal is over the general agreement on tariffs and oh, trade, oh, yeah, which yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the Whittemores uh, helped negotiate back in, under Eisenhower. <laughs> really? And uh, my father's cousin. But... Uh, they were going to take it be that uh, health care was an unfair advantage. But even the GATT court, I used to know the exact name of the court. This is ridiculous. Because most every, every industri every OECD country. Correct. And, uh, Correct. But then you're talking about mental health. In New Hampshire, there is not really mental health. No. I've been waiting uh, four weeks plus a few days to try to hear from uh, something called Veterans Count. Because they fanned out all these things that should be done at the VA, right. and uh, over, I'm trying to find. I have ADHD, but I can't take drugs. I don't hear from them, and like I said, the VA would be an entire uh, yeah, other thing. Sure. It, it, it was wrecked at the early part of this millennium when we had an entire congressional delegation that was Republican, and this is always, for some reason, oh, going yeah. to be a showcase for oh, privatization yeah. right. because of the primary or something. Right. And they seem to have, have finally done it in, you know, because there wasn't somebody watching over it then. We had dear old Frank Ginther, my opinion, but I don't think Frank Ginther's going <laughs> to su <laughs> sue me. I mean, I was up there. But mental health, we were reading, I was reading a thing uh, a year or two ago, but it's through the United States too, because of psychologists and psychiatrists, psychiatrists particularly, lowest paid of all doctors, people don't go into it. There aren't psychiatrists, and there, for some reason in New Hampshire, there just isn't a me the, the mental health healthcare infrastructure. That well, and of course we, you know, we, we devastated it uh, years ago when we, um, you know, sort of threw everyone out of the, the state hospital. Uh, some of, you know, I mean, that, granted, there were some abuses at the state hospital that certainly needed to be addressed. Well, that was the but Reagan then, era. Yeah, throw well, then we throw the everybody street. out on the streets, save money. right? It was yeah, save, save, money. save money. Didn't help anybody. Nationwide. Though, did it? Yeah, we're exactly, about. exactly. And of course, we suffered here in New Hampshire as well. And, any, and we've never done anything since. Right, any move know? like under the Clinton administration to get some type of parity. Mm, yeah. I don't know how Obama, uh, by that time, you know, wasn't even. It just didn't. It's. It doesn't work. Well, it doesn't. It doesn't I work. Mean, and it doesn't because it goes back to 1973. The idea that you know denying people care to make more money is not a sustainable concept in terms of providing health care to everyone in this country. And health care ought to be a right, not a privilege. Like it is in, in every oh civilized country. Uh, that's right. My, one of my favorite. I used to write about the health care industry. Uh, Business Week, still a decent magazine. I'll never forget a, uh, a cover story they had. It was just in the Bush year. W's administration had started. They says, well, you know, you have to be honest. Profit motive and delivering quality care don't go together. <laughs> yeah, the, the two... And yeah. the, the two you industries <laughs> where competition don't work are banking right. because you run yourself into you know 1929 again right. or nine, what was it 2007 right. and hospitals right. and they say that right. but we still have some health you know health stock picks for you. And, yeah. uh, well, and you still have people knowledge. talking about, oh, uh, you know, we, we need a market-based, uh, you know, healthcare system. And it's like, well, you know, no. <laughs> when you get no. cancer, <laughs> you know, you're not looking for some bargain basement way to, to be treated. You Look know? what happened. You know what? There used to be, from what I understand, Elliot and CMC. We have the we'll have the cancer. You have uh, the, the, uh, something else, you know, neuro neurology or something. Sure. But then suddenly, oh, we're all going to go in competition with everybody, and we're going to spend hundreds of millions of dollars on machines, right. which are incredible costs. Right. right. And, and somehow it's everything's going to be cheaper. And right? everything's yeah. going to be fine, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah, right. And then, from what I understand, River's Edge. Both the state and the feds, no, this isn't a good idea. Right. We build it anyway, and Elliot went into severe financial uh, 
distress, where Columbia HCA, a byword for Medicare fraud and Medicaid fraud back in the Clinton administration, Columbia HCA, who's the family of which Bill Frist, Bill the Frist. Republican, the, yeah, the leader yeah. of the, the yeah. Senate, he, that's when we were going to put all the veterans on HMOs when Bill Frist yeah, was yeah. the Senate. Columbia HCA, they hit them with a $250 million fraud, um, for Medicare fraud under Clinton, which would be peanuts now from right. the stuff that's going on. The cost of doing business. They, they are an actual for-profit, right. really throttle the care down. Oh, yeah. They were hovering over the Elliott Hospital, and it was like for, for a brief period. It's like, what is going on? It's insane. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if you just look at the economics of it, really, the, the only thing that makes sense is single payer. Yeah. It's the yeah. only thing that makes sense. Doctors don't control their practices. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And yeah. and they're all on schedules. They, you know, uh, you, you get 15 minutes if you're lucky, right? And and that's it because they have so many, that's they have a quota to meet, you know, from the insurance companies. I can say when the... They say, oh, we're going to take you from the VA and throw you on to the private health care system. Oh, hallelujah. Yeah. Everything's going to be fine oh, now. Yeah, You're yeah, not going to have right. to wait and everything. When the VA, after Carol and Paul Hodes got elected in 2006, and then Shaheen, Jean Shaheen got elected in 2008, the funding started coming in. The 160 some odd positions they had lost yes. before, from 2000 to 2006 were being filled again. Right. Now the, pro the process started right again. One thing you'd say about Bernie Sanders, even though he, when he was the vet, head of the veterans, he, he still talks about veterans and we need to fund the veterans. Right. You just can't run them down. That's They're right. great people that have no money. And then, oh, it's broken. Yeah, if I had your business, <laughs> it gets throttled and, oh, you're a failure or something. Crazy. Yeah. We'll have to have you back uh, next week if you want to come on because we'll have a better background where you don't have ears. Don't have we'll ears. get you between yeah, the two. We'll but that. there's so much to talk about. But yeah. just talking about health care because yeah. the VA I want to talk about, but we don't have time because uh, I'm in the unenviable position where I have to go to Massachusetts now yeah. if I want to get. I need. Uh, I need. I need care. Yeah, my dad had to go to Mass. And everybody, I meet people from Manchester. What are you still doing up there? I just was with the Department of Health and uh, Human Services. Yeah, we all we all know. They well, and, and, well, and even Mass, uh, you know, even Manchester. I, I met with a guy yesterday in uh, North Conway. We're doing. I, I was doing canvassing up there, and uh, he's a vet, uh, and he uh, has some some issues. Uh, and they have a clinic. I have mental health. They, issues. they have a clinic in yeah. in. Uh, uh, in North Conway right. for VA, a VA clinic, right? But if, uh, except for certain things, he can't just go to that clinic. He has to go two hours, uh, drive two hours uh, to Manchester, and throughout the, you know that that's four hours a day just driving to oh, yeah. to to, uh, to get medical uh, uh, care. I like have that, been you know. in Boston with old vets, Vietnam vets. Because you know most of the World War II are gone in tears because they go down there yeah. and there can be snafus and yeah. scheduling. Yeah. It's not because anybody's malevolent, although <laughs> we as veterans always we're so paranoid. <laughs> yeah. I tell you, when you've got PTSD, the VA is a place. <laughs> but uh, yeah, they. Uh, I have some stories about that which I've told. The it's just amazing. I mean, you know, this whole idea that. Uh, you, uh, to, to not fund the system yeah. and then break it and then right. look what we told you. Right. And uh, Well, of course, that's what they want to do now, That what the, what the Republicans want to do, you know, after this tax bill that they passed, <laughs> adding $1.3 you know, and they say, oh, I'm well, now we've got to do away with Medicare and Social Security because, you know, and yet, of course, that's not funded by general revenues. You know that's its own that's its own pot. You know what I'm saying? Both Social Security and Medicare. That doesn't come out of uh, general revenues. Hey, you know, but they they yeah. they try to make everyone think it does. And they think you know they got, they got this bait and switch. You know, I, I refer to that tax bill as the the greatest scam since the pet rock. <laughs> oh, the pet rock's not a scam. I was talking about <laughs> yeah, that with my sister. Not a scam. I was talking with my sister, my <laughs> father. My father saw the aluminum and vinyl siding. Okay, oh, well, so we won't go there. A pet we? rock is right, here. Have a set of steak knives, right? <laughs> I actually went out with one summer. Oh, it's my like, God. Jesus Christ. <laughs> well, I'm not supposed to. Uh, well, you know. Okay. Uh, what was it? Uh, yeah, yeah. 
Well, there's so much to talk about. We haven't even got this stuff. But if you uh, you want to come back, I don't know what you're doing next week or week. I know uh, you're. Well, I'll talk to my, my managers here somewhere. We'll we'll take a look at the schedule and see if we can. Oh, we can sit down and. Uh, yeah. Yeah, this has been great. It's we could sit fun. down and uh, go someplace, yeah. and I got ca yeah, two cameras set up because there's so much to talk about. And uh, there is uh, Casa Permanente. I, I have so many. Yeah, if I start telling my yeah, stories, we'll slow yeah. everything down. Listen to the tape. You know, I mean, it's it's incredible. It is just incredible. It's well, Nixon and Earl, man. It's a great conversation. It's like my therapist said. You know. Uh, was talking. I, I, have to, I have to go down to Bedford, Mass, saying things. Are, you, you, uh, I was angry about Trump. I'm supposed to stay away from politics, you know. No, oh, the well, stress is. I have a somatic reaction. Good job of doing that. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> that's one of the reasons. To go. When I live in California, I was never involved in politics. Here, you know, you're meeting the president. Yeah, well, you're, it's New you're, Hampshire. You're with somebody. You know, like Joe Biden's years, calling. Right. Every, every four years, they're all at the Joe, door, right? All Not four God. years. <laughs> all four well, years. Well, that's true. The it's never story. ending, right? We're talking true. with Martin O'Malley about what the press did to him <laughs> yeah, and stuff like that. And yeah. uh, but uh, saying I was mad at Trump. Says he, LBJ and Nixon. <laughs> This is this isn't out of the norm, except uh, this oh, guy just doesn't. This is out he doesn't of the norm. try to hide this, it. This is out of the norm. This is completely out of the norm. Nixon was pretty bad. And LBJ, Nixon was bad, but um, they were th both. This well, is a whole other dimension. Well, like William O. Douglas said, who hated Nixon, he was a hell of a advocate, a very excellent lawyer. Except he didn't stick to it. <laughs> <laughs> and though we, uh, I got some. Uh, We'll leave it about health care. I think we've got only a few minutes, but Earl Warren, who was the 1948 vice presidential candidate with the man that on the wedding cake, is, I think Dorothy Parker called him, Thomas Dewey, <laughs> said the only, the, the two, because he was a liberal, and so was Dewey when you think back and you look at it, although at the time you don't, uh, but Earl Warren always was a liberal, you know, California progressive, sure. and uh, Always regretted what happened to the Japanese after, and because uh, he was governor. But he said I could not. The two things I couldn't fight were oil and the AMA, the American Medical Association. Before you know, the healthcare yes, industry yes. was taken over by insurance. And Dewey says, Oh, I know about the AMA, but the oil because you know New York at that time was not you know, California. But years later, he says, you know, Earl, you were right about oil. Yeah, because yeah. He, be, he was a corporate attorney. I guess something had happened. Yeah. But uh, Earl Warren wanted to give health insurance to everybody in the 40s. <laughs> he didn't get anywhere near it. Yeah. And, well, uh, it's time. It's yeah. Time. It is well, time. it was great to have you, but you have to come back because there's so much to talk about. Sure. Sure. Happy and, to. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so can work that out. Okay. I guess we're at the end. Anything, where can people go to access your information? Oh, yeah, sure. A website. Uh, yeah, the website, it's uh, very simply lincolnsoldati.com. Okay. You okay. named after the great emancipator? Well, it's funny. Or, uh, or well, an automobile. Well, no, uh, <laughs> it, this goes back to my grandfather. When he came to this country, he read about Abraham Lincoln. He was so impressed. And, and so right. one day he announces, my next son born in America is going to be named Lincoln. That was my dad. So I was named after my dad. So at least my if first been, name. If he'd been, uh, if it'd been sometime, a lot of people were named Roosevelt. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But he was impressed by Lincoln. So that okay. was that. Was that. So well, we'll have to talk about your, your take on like the Supreme Court, but we only got five seconds left. <laughs> Bye, folks. <laughs> Thank you.